Hello, this is Mr. Fredericks here to talk about World War II and the specifically the Battle of the Atlantic. Huge, huge ongoing battle in World War II. Um, seemingly everything rested on. So let's get to it. Let's talk about the Battle of the Atlantic and what that would be. So um, context. In 1941, Germany looked unbelievably powerful. They had conquered just about everything, at least in Europe. But something suddenly changed on December 7th, 1941. Japan is going to bomb Hawaii, more specifically Pearl Harbor. And that means the U.S. is going to join the war. And because of the Axis Pact, uh, when the U.S. went to war with Japan, Germany felt obligated to declare war on the U.S. itself. So now the U.S. is at war with both Japan and Germany. Well, Hitler had some problems because even though Great Britain was hurting at that time, now the uh, United States is allied with Great Britain, which makes Great Britain potentially so much stronger because the United States would be standing side by side with it. Now, that means Germany has a problem because Germany could never really handle a two front war. As powerful as Germany was, uh, they, they had to fight the Soviet Union, which was absolutely a vicious opponent on their east. And now with the U.S. joining the war and us moving to Britain, that's a huge power to the west. Now, previously, Britain had been kind of smashed or ground to powder. But now with the U.S. there, we potentially are going to lead an invasion from Britain. And that's a two-front war that Hitler knows he can't win, World War I or World War II. So that's a problem. So the Soviet Union is so formidable that Hitler can't defeat them easily. But Germany does have some hope to avoid this two-front war. And that is if they can quickly, quickly, quickly defeat Britain, knock them out of the war before the U.S. can mobilize and get troops over to Britain, then um, this Germany can then eliminate that Western Front and just put all of their resources against the Soviet Union, which they might be able to win that war. So it's all about keeping the U.S. out of the war by knocking Britain out of the war. So if not, the U.S. will send troops and invade from Britain. And that we know as D-Day, which, you know, might actually happen. So Germany itself is sad. It needs to avoid the two front war. It needs to knock Britain out of the war. So it gets an idea. First, it had been fighting the Battle of Britain for some time. It had been bombing um, Britain, you know, all of its airfields, its cities, uh, the, the Blitz trying to get Britain to surrender. And it wasn't working. So he says, how about we do something a little more aggressive, a little different? So the German blockade that Hitler orders to put U-boats all the way around Britain. And that way they'll sink every single ship that comes to Britain, even neutral ships. And that means Britain will have no supplies. They needed about 1 million tons of stuff, including food, every week. And if that can be all be sent to the bottom of the ocean because the U-boats are sinking them with torpedoes, that means Britain's going to have to drop out of the war. And that means no two front war. Hitler can focus on the Soviet Union and win the World War II. So the Battle of the Atlantic is Hitler's go uh, attempt to knock Britain out of the war. And the Battle of the Atlantic is the U.S., uh, Canada, and Britain's attempt to keep Britain in the war. So uh, who ends up winning the Battle of the Atlantic? Well, that's the point of this presentation. So let's figure it out because it's unbelievably huge. If Britain drops out of the war, there's no way Hitler's going to get defeated. And if Britain uh, doesn't drop out of the war, the U.S. is going to come into the war and there's no way Hitler's going to win. So one can argue that World War II, victory therefore of, is hinged on this. So who is going to win? Is it going to be the United States uh, under the leadership of FDR or Germany under Hitler? So 1943, World War II had been going on for some time at this point. The United States by that point had been losing the uh, Battle of the Atlantic. 3,500 merchant ships bought in the ocean. 30,000 of our sailors dead, 175 professional class battleships were sunk and had sunk in the ocean. It's the most ridiculous and sad and terrible thing. We were losing the battle of the Atlantic. We were losing the war. It was not good. But FDR had an idea. He's like, all right, we, we can't let these merchant ships get sunk anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of our merchant ships and have them meet at various point, ports. And then we're going to surround them with battleships. We're going to call these convoys. The convoys are going to go across the ocean together. And the battleships will hopefully keep them safe so that Britain and to some extent the Soviet Union keep getting these supplies. So, bam, the U.S. is going to send these convoys to Britain and to the Soviet Union. And, of course, the subs are going to chase the convoys, trying to sink them. And that's the Battle of the Atlantic. Well, in 1943, we're still getting our ships sunk. We're losing. It does not look good. Reason one why we were losing the Battle of the Atlantic, and that's what we're going to talk about, is that the subs were just tricky. They were invisible. They were under the ocean. We couldn't see them. It wasn't a fair fight. They could just sink us without us even knowing they were there. And we did get a lot of ships sunk, right? Reason number two, 
merchant ships had mechanical errors. They were not the most reliable engines back in the 1940s. So many of them would have trouble, they would stall. And when they're in the middle of the convoy, like hundreds of the merchant ships were, and one of them stalls, you can't stop, you'd be a sitting duck. So convoys left behind ships all the time. And when that convoy left behind just one of those ships, when it, when it stopped, it became a sitting duck. And that is gonna result in ships getting picked off. Uh, number three reason why so many of our ships are being taken out, a U-boat is no match for a battleship. It just isn't. So to even the odds, U-boats always traveled in groups or packs, similar to a wolf pack. They were nicknamed in World War II a wolf pack, and uh, partly because they had ha hunting tactics like wolves. So let me give you an example. They often hunted at nighttime when they couldn't be seen, and they often hunted, of course, a group to take down larger prey. An example of this would be, let's say this is a convoy with a battleship protecting some weak merchant ships. Sub shows up, the battleship will chase it away. But it's a trick because then another sub will show up on the other side and will sink these ships and crush them. And that's gonna result in a lot of ships sunk. And that's why these U-boats were called wolf packs. Reason four why the German uh, uh, wolf packs were doing so well and putting us out of the war, even when uh, German subs rose up and sunk a ship, they could then just dive unbelievably quick before we could even get a shot off on them. Um, subs are really good for that. So reason five, when a ship got sunk, its survivors would be swimming in the water close to death. And only a certain amount of time can happen before you freeze to death in the North Atlantic. So um, other ships would rush over to help them. And then those ships would get sunk because a, a sub knew those ships were going to come. They were easy prey and they just sat there ready to sink them. So it actually got worse sometimes where ships were uh, scared to go close to a, a ship that was getting sunk. And, the, and they just stood from afar and watched uh, their friends, you know, die, drown. It's very sad. So who won the Battle of the Atlantic? Well, in 1943, Britain was about to lose. Our ships were getting sunk. They didn't have the supplies or food. And Hitler was about to win. But something changed. America changed the way we fought the Battle of the Atlantic. And that's how we're going to gain the advantage. So let's go over a couple of those changes. Number one. The U.S. is going to have a problem. It's convoys were getting sunk left and right, and that's not a good thing. And so the U.S. said, well, we got to defend this better. So the U.S. got planes and sent the planes around the ocean looking for the subs. And if a plane saw a, sump, a, a sub, this, the subs were absolutely no match for them, right? Subs took a while, a, a little bit to go under the water, and a plane could just come down at 500 miles per hour and sink them so, or bomb, bomb them. So... The U.S. had a problem, and that was that the planes didn't have enough gasoline. Um, they just didn't. They could fly. I mean, they could fly from North America, or they could fly from Europe and cover the ocean around there. But they would run out of fuel by the time they got to the middle of the ocean, so they couldn't go to the middle of the ocean. So the convoys were on their own. They couldn't have planes scouting for them. So the United States got an idea: though, let's not use planes. Let's use blimps. Blimps don't use an excessive amount of oil, or any, I don't think. And ultimately, without that oil, they can just float around forever and look for subs and radio ahead, tell convoys to leave, go the other direction. So the use of blimps definitely started saving lives and oil. So change number two, a convoy travels across the ocean. And if a U-boat saw the convoy, U-boats aren't the fastest ships in the world, particularly if they're underwater. So they would radio ahead to another a submarine to intercept the um, convoy now that they knew where the convoy was. And they would meet the convoy and, of course, sink some of its ships. So what the U.S. said was, from now on, our leaders of our convoys would, would um, a zigzag. And that basically meant they would constantly turn in random directions. So that if anybody ever, if a sub ever saw where they were going, they wouldn't know where they were ending up because they were going to take a random turn at some point. And that certainly helped things. Um, it was a little less efficient, not a straight line, not as fast, but, you know. So in addition to using blimps and zigzagging, Another change was when the Allied boats started to use sonar. Sonar is basically radar, but under the ground, under the water. What you do is you strap a microphone under your, under your ship, and then you release a pulse of sound, and it just keeps going forever, the sound does, unless it hits something metal. And if it hits something metal, it gets bounced back, and using math, we can figure out, depending on how many seconds it took to get back, how far away the sub is. And so there are some limitations of sonar for finding the enemy. If you're in the middle of a battle, there's so much noise that you can't hear the sonar. So that's a problem. Moving on, change number four that the Allies made to better um, uh, deal with this crisis in World War II 
Germany had its subs communicating with each other via radio. And that's how they knew where to go and what they're doing. So the thing about it is the United States, um, the United States would listen to these radio frequencies and they could see which direction they were coming from, right? You could hear that the radio signal was strongest in that direction. So now you knew where the sub was, but the problem was you didn't know how far away it was. You just knew the direction. Well, in 1943, one of the major changes that made us, uh, the United States begin to win the uh, Battle of the Atlantic was the United States was mobilizing. We now had more factories than anybody pounding away at making ships. And we had so many more ships. And why is that important? Well, so those ships could use something called triangulation or geometry to figure out where the, the subs were. So now when the sub was using radio, the German sub was using radio, we knew that one ship knew that the, the sub was in that direction. But now that we had so many more ships in the Battle of the Atlantic because of our mass mobilization, we now would have two ships that would hear that radio signal and they each knew a direction. But the thing about it was, that by triangulating those two straight lines, you can figure out exactly where that sub is. And now it can be hunted or certainly avoided, right? So another change that the U.S. made was we had problems. And that was that every time that we got attacked, the subs would just dive really quick, fill up their outer hall with water. And that was upsetting. But we started to, to basically improve our depth charges. What depth charges are are big metal crates that are, you can set to blow up at a certain depth and that these ships would drop them in the water, hopefully blowing up underwater subs. So basically the ocean would look like that. But either way, this is an actual real World War II picture of a ship dropping depth charges, hoping to get a sub. But you can almost see just how big the ocean is, right? Those subs definitely had the advantage. They couldn't be seen and, and they could hide in a lot of water. Now, this is a, an example of, if you can see, a, a sub um, getting blown up with a depth charge. Here's another sub getting blown up with a depth charge. Sorry, my voice is starting to go. Those are actual depth charges. You get a little bit of a close look at them. Depth charges really only worked about 6% of the time because the subs could go so low that they wouldn't explode near them. And also, it's just a big ocean. Subs could change direction. You, just, you wouldn't know. So anyway, there was an idea. They did improve upon this technology during World War II a little bit. They actually created something called hedgehogs. Hedgehogs were 24 missiles that would spread out and fire in every which direction near where the sub was. This is important because it covered a lot of area, but it's also important because these um, hedgehogs wouldn't blow up. They wouldn't blow up unless something hit something. And if something hit something, then all of them would blow up, covering the whole area. The reason why this is important is because the, the US ships could still use sonar with hedgehogs because there wasn't constant explosions. And that allowed them to hunt down these subs and blow them up whichever way they wanted to. Now, depth charges. Again, uh, we just kind of talked about all that. So the um, success rate under um, depth charges was only, like I said, about 6%, 25% for hedgehogs. So we were trading up on technology. Next, the sixth change, Germany, excuse me, Germany um, had a problem. And that problem was the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was, you know, was a slow starter to the war. They weren't entirely mobilized and they got their butts kicked by Hitler at first. But now they had their factories mobilized and now they were ready to go. And they also had billions of dollars of U.S. military equipment now. But either way, the Soviet Union was defending its city called Stalingrad. Stalingrad was the city on the Volga River that protected the oil supplies of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union would have to drop out with no oil if Stalingrad was captured. So both leaders said no retreat, and they threw all of their soldiers into Stalingrad. In that battle, it eventually got so cold that you know a smart person would have taken Hitler's military and moved them back out of the country until the winter was over because they couldn't do much. But he said, no, if I move my troops back, the U.S. will eventually come in and defeat me. I, I need to defeat the Soviet Union before the U.S. comes in. So he gave the no retreat order. So the Battle of Stalingrad, Hitler's troops fought and fought and fought and basically were eventually surrounded by the Soviet army as they were freezing to death. So why is this important? Well, Germany um, had only so much money and they decided to put it in the army rather than the navy, which meant there's going to be almost no subs around. So no money for subs is going to result in Hitler losing the Battle of the Atlantic, which is going to result in Britain staying in the war. And American, America would invade Europe from Britain. And then invade, this invasion would lead to a two-front war, and Hitler can't win a two-front war. So this is entire. So no money for subs. Putting all of your money into rebuilding your army that lost to Stalingrad is going to kill um, the, the Germany. They're, not going to, they're going to lose the Battle of the Atlantic and get cut off, right? Now, Hitler's, Hitler's number one mistake, you know, could have been the no retreat order at Stalingrad, could have been, 
But I would argue that he never should have attacked the Soviet Union before defeating Great Britain. And that's a, that was a big deal. So moving on, uh, change number seven that allowed the U.S. to gain the upper hand in the Battle of the Atlantic was U.S. industrial production. We know this. The U.S. has more factories than anybody in the world. And in 1943, we only could make so many ships. But then after mobilization, we had so many ships. And they're going to outnumber the Germany ships. And we're going to do significantly better. So Germany, meanwhile, was having the opposite problem. They were putting all their resources, which were running out, into their army because of the Battle of Stalingrad. And they weren't putting them into subs. And so there were less and less subs attacking the U.S. The U.S. was slowly getting ready to win the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, the U.S., again, what <clears throat> was out, once they began producing those ships, they could be destroying all of those um, subs. And this is actually a chart of all the subs that were lost year to, month to month. And if you notice, it's low at first, but right around when you get to 1943, um, the U.S. starts sinking an endless amount of ships. And that's pretty crazy and powerful. The eighth and final change that helped the United States gain the upper hand in the um, Battle of the Atlantic was the Enigma machine. So British sailors found out about a disabled German submarine and they approached the disabled German U-boat and then they took it over. Um, kind of a fun story, but they took it over and they got what was called the Enigma machine. This was the machine that Germany was um, that two, whenever the Germans communicated, they had one of these machines on the on both sides and it allowed them to totally type up but communicate out on a code what they were um, talking about. And this included orders of where subs needed to go and where they should be patrolling and things like that. So we now had the Enigma machine. We could hear their communication. To, and that is going to allow us to track every single sub and know exactly where they were and then blow them up. Um, and it got to the point where the German young soldiers were hoping that they would get assigned to the Army, not the Navy, because the German uh, subs were nicknamed Iron Coffins. It was just a question of time before you died. Uh, and that, and this map shows exactly where we sunk um, the German subs and whatnot. So who actually ended up winning the Battle of the Atlantic? I would argue that, and I would be correct in saying that the Allies won, the US, Britain, and Russia, or the Soviet Union, I should say. And, and how do we know we won? Because Britain stayed in the war. And then the US is going to send troops over to Britain and lead the D-Day attack with Britain. And that is going to create a two-front war, and Germany can't win one. It was just a matter of time. Um, so, um, so much to learn about the Battle of Britain. But um, again, if you have any questions, reach out and contact me. And uh, thank you. Uh, and we'll talk about more World War II topics next time.